I got five minutes. I thought, I'm not going to be able to tell you a lot in five minutes. And so, um, and I usually hate talking at people. Uh, I move much better in Q and A's. So I figured I'll use all of my minutes as much as possible in Q and A's. Uh, but before I do that, I'll just give you a little bit of my background so you can sort of think about what kind of questions you can potentially ask me. And then I'll give you my little, literally two cents, two words. So a little bit about me. Um, I was most recently the co-founder and CEO of Ada. Ada did uh, use AI technologies and NLP to answer customer support questions. We were actually recently acquired in December by uh, Vision Critical. So I'm now leading uh, the data science team at Vision Critical, so that's my team there. Um, I'm also a, a partner at Panda Angel Partners, so I do um, angel investment on the side, and you'll see why as I go down my career list. Um, before Ada, I was the co-founder and CEO of Metaphor Software. It was another machine learning AI company. We did anomaly detection on big time series data coming out of data centers. That company was acquired by Splunk. So if anyone who knows uh, locally Splunk Vancouver, that was my team that ended up there and is now growing. I think they're hiring as well. Um, before I started my entrepreneurial journey, I was actually a VC. So I took a, a very opposite direction from most VCs. Um, I was actually an investor for almost 10 years, invested in a bunch of local startup companies. Um, and then before that, I did consulting, and I, I have an engineering background. So I, I took a very backwards kind of approach. So questions you can ask me, anything about fundraising, obviously, uh, anything about AI, machine learning, um, angel investing, how to start companies, yada, yada. So my two cents. First, um, you know, the, the topic was <laughs> give, share some of your, your wisdom, your learnings to the entrepreneurial community. And, and the thing I think I learned most, um, both seen through as a VC as well as myself in, in two startup, is you have to have a lot of courage to start a company. Um, you don't have to have a lot of brains. You have to work really hard, <laughs> but you need a lot of courage. Courage just to even get started. Most people are working at their jobs, they're comfortable, and to even make that first jump is hard. And so you have to sort of blindly make that leap. And then there's courage every step of the way because there are so many bad moments. And when you hit those bad moments, you have to have the courage to get up the next morning and keep going and lead your team. Right? You have to have the courage to talk to your customers. I know so many tech founders that won't go out and talk to customers. Why? Because they don't want to hear that the customers don't like what they have. And that is so important to get out early and just go and talk to customers and hear that is crap or this part is crap and so you can fix it. Right? So everywhere along the entrepreneurial journey, you have to have an abundance of courage. And so just, just remember that. If you don't have that, that's okay. You can have your nice job, so that's just a different path. But if you're going to do this entrepreneurial thing, you got to take the leap and you got to be not afraid. Not, I mean, everybody's afraid. Everybody panicked all the time as a founder, <laughs> as I found out myself. Um, so everybody's always constantly afraid. And so you just got to recognize that that's going to happen to you. And that's okay because it's happening to all of us. That's the other thing I learned. This is happening to all of us. <laughs> Nobody knows what they're doing. All right. The second most important thing is luck. That's it. Pure luck. As a VC, I saw many entrepreneurs that were so smart, that worked so hard, and just never made it. And the other ones that were smart and maybe didn't work as hard or weren't quite there, all there, but worked really asses off and got lucky and they made it, right? So there's just so much, so much luck involved in this. And you have to remember that. When, you know, so when you do something really good and the customer buys your stuff or you happen to hit the market right, it's not all you. It's probably you got lucky, right? And the converse is true. When the shift's happening, you gotta remember, you know, bad luck happens. It's not you. You worked hard, you're smart, you did everything you could, and shit still happens. And it happens all the time. And so you gotta get up the next morning, be courageous, you know, lead your team, and keep going. Okay? So that's my two little bits of advice. <laughs> that's it for my talk. Um, and I'm open for questions. Oh, sorry, there was one down there. Uh, as an angel investor, what type of deals are yeah, so um, I have a little angel fund with a group of people. Um, we do fairly uh, small size deals, but we typically co-invest in anywhere from, um, typical deal rounds are anywhere from half a million to a million. And the sizes of round, we don't put in that much ourselves. We'll put in anywhere from 50 to 100. Um, but we're, we've done everything from um, very early stage, like first money in. We invested in a, a company called Iris Automation. It came out of uh, UBC that moved down to the Bay Area, went to YC, and they have now raised Series A, 8 million from Bessemer. So we were one of the first investors in that. 
Uh, we invested in another company called Aspect Bio, it's another UBC company, they're doing 3D printing, right? That was a little bit of a later round, and so that was in life sciences. So you can see we kind of go, you know, the swap. Um, what I look for is really the founder. Do I like the founder, right? Do they have what it takes? And also, do they have really interesting defensible either technology or market? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs when choosing either an angel investor to join their team or a VC? Um, choose someone that you'd want to work with. It is so important. I've seen so many deals screwed up. Uh, VCs invested, they don't get along, or angels invested, they don't get along. Um, that was another bit of courage. Um, actually, early on in, in Metaphor, I had an angel. Um, he was really the only one at the table uh, willing to do, lead the deal. And we ended up saying no to him because of the way the whole process went, we just didn't have a good gut feel about it. And it was hard saying no to your only money, right? And <laughs> you don't know what else is coming. Um, that was really hard, so, uh, but, but I've seen enough, I mean, luckily I was a VC and I've seen enough deals go awry later on to know, you know, if I'm having this weird gut feeling about this person, I better hold off. And so I think, I think in your gut you'll know who you can work with and who you can't, and, and listen to that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, data. Sorry. Are you allowed to speak about my? Oh no, no. We're we're so at um, so at Ada we used uh, primarily um, natural language processing because it's customer support. Uh, but at Vision Critical, a lot of it is more. We're looking at uh, sort of big data analytics. They collect a lot of uh, survey information, survey data. So we're looking at sort of getting insights out of that kind of survey data. Um, as you know, you know, in in AI, it's all about big data. Right? How much can you get? Um, do you have label data? Do you have the right data? A lot of issues there, but that's kind of what we're focused on. Yeah, over there. So I'm new in town, starting in Montreal. There's a lot of, I do AI consulting, and there's a lot of AI back in Montreal. Yes. But I haven't seen many AI-oriented startups here. Any yes. advice about where they can go? No, I, I, th there's not a lot, I have to say. Um, when we started um, Metaphor Software, it was t um, 2011, we raised first raise money. 2010 we started, 2011 first raise money. And we started building sort of deep machine learning, learning stuff and sort of today what we called AI, we just called it ML at the time, right? There was nobody doing it, right? Um, I haven't seen any really interesting AI companies. Uh, there's a Qubit, uh, is it what, one Qubit is doing some stuff around, but, but mostly for quantum computing. Um, I think companies individually, I mean locally, there's, I know Flipboard is doing some of their, there's some data science stuff going on. Um, I think 4C has a presence here. There's a few, also a few small AI startups, like focused primarily on AI, but not a lot, I have to say. Um, the government has been putting money in, like the way Toronto and Montreal have, so they've done a great job, but they also had the researchers there. They had the leading lights, right? And we, we, didn't, we don't have it in Vancouver, so. Yeah, I, know, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> So it sounds like there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the room, I'm one myself. Uh, really curious to know, because it looks like you've built a lot of amazing teams, and specifically, what did you do, what avenues did you take, what yeah. methods did you use to hire amazing talent to, yeah. you know, now yeah. end up where you are today? So definitely good people attract good people, so I always make sure I found a good founder that I, I, I respect and I can work with, right? So my first co-founder at Metaphor was Tufik Bubez, and I found him because actually at BDC, BDC was an investor in his, company, in his first company um, called Layer 7, which sold for like $300 million to uh, a CA later on, right? or 200 something. So he was a CTO, the early C first CTO and founder of uh, CA, so, or um, of Layer 7. So I knew him already. I didn't, uh, at BDC, I wasn't the investor on his board, but I knew him, right? And so when I was ready to start something, we chatted. I, I, so I knew about him and I was comfortable working with him. For, for Ada, so, so after Metaphor was acquired, uh, of course Tufik is locked in as, as Splunk and he, he's, he's working on some really wonderful stuff over there right now. And so he wasn't ready to leave. So for Ada, I actually went through my LinkedIn. I knew what I was looking for, I had an idea, I said I'm looking for a natural language guy who in Vancouver or around Vancouver can do that. So I trolled through LinkedIn. Um, I've contacted lots of people. I, I must have talked to 30, 40 like PhDs and stuff on the phone. One of the guys I talked to had his PhD from UBC but was, and had some NLP experience but was working for Zillow. 
And he had just moved, uh, he lived in Vancouver, but he was commuting to Seattle. So I thought, oh, maybe I can attract him to stay in Vancouver. But he had just gotten there and he had a young family. He said, look, I'm not ready to leave, but I have a friend. He's just finished his PhD in computational physics. He actually has an interest in NLP um, and he likes startups. So do you want to talk to him? That's how I got introduced. So it's, it's just mining your network and just hard work, basically. You know? um, so this is so my current co-founder uh, or my, you know, at Ada. It's great, I mean, one of the smartest guys I have ever met. And, and works his ass off, and is really, really smart. Um, you know, just I didn't know him before. It was just through through the networking. And just to clarify, so that's like quite high up in the chain, the food chain, so to speak, of the organization. Yeah. What about? Because I think it, this probably applies to people who are developers in the room and yeah. and other roles that aren't you know, like they're not looking to be the next co-founder. Yeah. But maybe they just want to be like one of the first developers. How did you find that talent? Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Our first, one of our first developers, it was uh, a couple of kids that I had met when I was doing some um, EI, as an EIR at UBC. I had actually heard their pitch, and I didn't. I, I liked the the, the the couple of kids, but uh, I didn't think their pitch was, you know, the, the idea was that good. I ran into them accidentally at the startup uh, incubator I was at. <laughs> when we started talking, I told them what we were building. He thought it was cool. I was like, well, you want to come and do some coding for me? <laughs> That's how I got my team. I, I don't know, it was kind of lucky that way. Um, I, at, at Metaphor, we recruited through, like two feet already knew some people, so then through them, and then they knew some people. So those first early couple of few recruits, I would say is through our network, rather than just you know put up an ad, and it's really hard, right? Doing the, the ad work that way. Sure, there's two. Uh, you mentioned luck as one of your factors. I was chatting with somebody else in the crowd earlier about luck, and actually how luck is more of like a preparation and being the right time, being actually prepared to take on uh, the space. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that and just kind of like, yeah. you're, you're at two different sort of spaces, yeah. which makes you run into people who are up and coming in the space. Yeah. That probably has so, so my perspective on luck is um, you, have to be, you have to be in the game to get lucky, right? If you're not even in the game, you're never, you're never, if you don't buy the lotto ticket, you'll never win. So you have to be in the game and you have to be prepared, you have to be smart, you have to be hardworking so you can recognize it when it happens and you can take advantage of it. I see many good, like decent entrepreneurs who don't take advantage of it when luck happens. Right? So you have to be prepared. So uh, yeah, staying luck doesn't take away from the fact that you have to work your ass off, you have to be smart, you know, all of those things. It, but then you also have to be lucky. It's, it's the additive. It's like luck asterisks. Yeah, yeah. It just being, I mean, I have seen a couple of people that just hit it, you know, just got lucky, right? I mean, that, that happens too. But the, the people that are able to really build the big companies, they get lucky and they know it and they can leverage that. There's other entrepreneurs that I've seen that built, you know, okay size companies. They never got that big, but it was okay. And they got lucky and they kind of just never was able to grow beyond it, right? So. For Ida, so obviously to make it work, you need some sort of uh, background and data that you already have. So what sort of data can you have for customer service? Where yeah, so actually we got data from the customers. Um, we got their uh, data from their uh, call, uh, call like support software, like Zendesk, if they're using Zendesk. We're able to take their, their, uh, the data out of that and learn from the raw data. So we were doing some unsupervised learning techniques. So it like a year, 10 years worth of data? Give us whatever you have. Last question. Five years ago, you probably could. A lot of their uh, tools are really good, but the tools are really basic, right? Like I always say, those tools that you get from AWS and Google, they're like Lego blocks you still have to put them together and then you still have to optimize it for your problem. So there's still many steps. Um, we, we, in, in, in our platform at Ada, we use some you know, Google, Google stuff and then a lot of it our own. So it's a, it's a blend. I have another question. That is when your customers um, indicate customer satisfaction is zero and they meant to say five, is your system smart enough to be able to swap those around? <laughs> no, we never got that far. <laughs> we were more reading the text and see if we can automatically answer the question. Sorry, one more? Okay. Yeah, um, I'm not familiar with the history of 
Ida. Ida, yeah. And the sell to the, can you just give us a history of the company? Because the sell to Vision Critical seems a little incongruous to me. And what's, is the product still working? Like, was that a, yeah, no, we actually. Asset sale or yeah, it was an asset sale. Yeah, yeah, it was an asset sale. Most of the team went over. Um, it was a pretty quick exit, um, to be honest. Um, we, we, we started talking to them you know, in late last year, and, and, and it happened very quickly. It was the right thing to do for, for our company. I think that's, uh, you, you can recognize when things are the right things to do or not, and it was, it was the right fit at the time. So it was just like, okay, so let's go for it. We did have a couple of customers using our product. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 